Welcome to The Refuge, a CERC podcast to share our research with practitioners and communities. We are starting today's episode with Ahmad's story of his experience as a young refugee, recorded and shared with the permission of JU, a Toronto-based charity committed to sharing human rights stories through the arts. Hello, my name is Ahmed. I'm 13 years old. I'm from Syria. When the war started, I was sitting down with my family and I felt the fear. I lived for one year in war. Then I went to Jordan for three years and I had a lot of friends there, but I didn't feel safe in Jordan. They called us to come to Canada and now I feel safe. I've been living here for six months now. Canada is my second home. I feel safe with my family and friends. In Syria, our schools got damaged, but in Canada, we're back in school. So now we can look to a brighter future. Thank you. I'm your host, Israel. I'm my guest today. I'm going to start with Katrin Lindner. I hope I said that correctly. Um, an associate okay. professor at the German Department of the University of Munich, specializing in bilingual language acquisition and more recently in early literacy, Becky Chen, Professor of Applied Psychology and Human Development at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education uh, at the University of Toronto, and Monique Gagne, uh, a research associate with the Human Early Learning Partnership in the School of Population and Public Health at UBC. Thanks for coming to The Refuge today. Hello, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm going to start with Catherine. What would like to talk about today is refugee children and um, actual acculturization. And with Catherine, I'll start with you. Have you noticed any differences working with um, other your colleagues here in Canada? Certainly, there's a major difference. I mean, the, the whole perception of immigration is different. For instance, in Canada, you have, uh, uh, once refugees come to Canada, they're safe. They, they can't be kicked out of the country. This is very different in Germany. For instance, officially, uh, Germany is not an immigrant country. But, so it's, I mean, so there are less, less rights and less infrastructure for newcomers less rights in that way that asylum seekers have to request asylum within the country after their arrival. And they have to wait for the decision. And that waiting can be sometimes for months, even a year. And uh, they are allowed to stay for three years. And that stay can be prolonged for another three years if the reasons why they uh, seek asylum is are still pertaining. So the, the people are well aware of the situation that they may, be, have to, may have to leave the country after a certain time. And even the children are quite aware of that. They know that perhaps there is somebody who doesn't like them, as they say in the interview, uh, so that they have to leave the country. Mm, mm. And Becky, you are and Becky, you are part of this research. What would the difference be here in Canada? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with uh, Catherine. So Catherine and I conducted this uh, collaborative project, and Catherine interviewed refugee families in Germany. Well, I interviewed um, um, refugee families in Canada, so we found that um, the sense of security uh, played a big role in how they adapted to the host country. So uh, in Germany, the situation was somewhat temporary because they had to apply, um, I guess, for permission to stay, and Mm -hmm. uh, each time they could stay uh, for three years, and then that will have to be extended. Uh, but in Canada, everybody was granted uh, permanent residency upon their arrival. So parents felt more secure 
And what we found was this affected how they adapted uh, to the to the host country. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, in Canada, uh, parents were comfortable about um, speaking Arabic L1 at home. So they um, they asked children um, to to speak L1 so they can maintain ties to uh, to the community. But at the same time, they were they were very active in learning English so that they could, um, you know, uh, study and find jobs in Canada. But I think the, the situation was slightly different um, in Germany based our findings, right, Kjertun? <laughs> in Germany, actually, as I said, since there is this insecurity, people don't know whether they have to leave again. So they put all the emphasis they have on learning that language where they are right now, like German. Um, And so the cultural identity with a Muslim culture, with Arabic cultures, are not left aside, but I mean, they're sort of not that important. They're not focused on. Mm. So parents say that German is actually more important than Arabic for the children. Mm. And that's a big difference to Canada. Yeah, and to break it down for our audience, L1 is your first language and L2 is a new language you pick up in the country you uh, immigrate to. Exactly. So, Monique, you want to talk a little bit about your own project, your research project? Yeah, sure. So what we did with our project was... Um, try to understand a bit more about the school and community resources that uh, refugee children perceived um, having and essentially how that tied to their adaptation and not just their academic adaptation, but I think really importantly, their social and emotional adjustment and adaptation in Canada. And so um, that work turned out to be really interesting and, and, and potentially, you know, obvious to some, but, you know, those, those children who perceived having these school and community resources at their disposable, at their disposal, sorry, um, just had, that was associated with a whole host of positive outcomes and um, in particular social and emotional outcomes. And what I mean by that are things like, um, satisfaction with life and optimism and self-esteem and um, less sadness and anxiety, um, as well as as uh, things like literacy and numeracy um, development. So, so that was um, that was sort of the gist of of the research we did, yeah. um, and I think. Yeah, what it really showed to us is is the importance of school for refugee children, and and not just in the ways that uh, we typical typically think about schools, right? For re- learning, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and th- that sort of classic idea. Um, but for refugee children in particular, just having the access to resources and supports that are going to support their social emotional development, which is obviously huge for um, children who have gone through. Um, just an extensive sometimes amount of um, trauma and, uh, you know, deprivation in in certain situations. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, The situations, and we've seen it in the news online, uh, that some of the refugees go through just to move from their home country to the new country they're moving is enough to give a person um, dealing with give trauma to last for a while when you were conducting your research um katrin did something did was any part of your research or your project that i talked about or focused or dealt with the trauma that some of the refugee children and their parents emigrated with yeah unfortunately we didn't do too much on that because for one reason um, we didn't want to intrude on the children and not on the parents either so we only did once one question there the SDQ and um, that was in the second year we had it two fortunately we had a study and a follow-up study so in the follow-up study we did this this questionnaire and then if we found out that uh, for instance the children quite often were uh, 
had lots of worries about whatever happens. They were very insecure. They were restless. They were um, said they couldn't concentrate. They said that actually they would like to share with with all the children, which is really a difference to German children who don't really like to share that mm. much. Uh, uh, but on the whole, it was sort of like, uh, um, yeah, they've just felt very restless and not secure. Mm. Becky, do you want to add to that? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so in the uh, so the the study did um, Katrin and I did uh, was situated in a larger project. So in the larger project, we gave everybody the the SDQ questionnaire where we gathered information about um, children's mental health and well-being. So we're just analyzing the data now. So what we found um, is um, there, there is a correlation. There's a relationship between um, their mental health and well-being and their performance on uh, reading, uh, reading tasks. So uh, I'll give you some uh, specific examples. For example, if uh, parents rated children to have higher um, ADHD symptoms than those children, uh, will tend to perform lower on uh, English uh, word reading measures. So it shows that um, uh, mental health and behavior problems um, have a negative impact um, on the development of refugee children. Um, in a, a separate analysis, we found um, externalizing um, also had um, a, a negative relation with their reading comprehension performance. Interestingly, we also found that um, these relations um, were mediated by their refugee camp um, experience. So if they spend more time in a refugee camp before they arrived in Canada, then they were more likely to have these symptoms. And then these symptoms were more likely to have a negative impact on their um, language and literacy performance. I think the, the results just demonstrate that um, mental health and well-being are really important um, for refugee children's uh, language and literacy development. Mm. Monique, I see you nodding. Do you want to, yeah? Yeah, well, I mean, it just really lines up with um, the conversations that we've had over here in BC with um, uh, teachers and, and settlement workers working with refugee children. And, you know, one of the fundamental things that really comes out of those conversations is you can't you can't separate, um, you know, the emotional and behavioral and cultural challenges that a refugee child, refugee child come, um, has um, in the context of the classroom from their learning. And those things are so, um, are so linked and, and you almost, you know, there's, there's no ability to um, address one without addressing the other. Um, and so, so that just, that, uh, rings true for me just from those, those conversations that we've had in those focus groups on the topic. Um, mm. and so, yeah, I think it's just the, the importance I think needs to be emphasized in being able to address all of the challenges that refugee children may be facing in order to be able to address, um, their language development and their learning in general. Mm. Yeah, uh, Becky, while Becky was talking, uh, mentioned the living conditions they might have had in the refugee camp before they moved to Canada. I'm wondering, Catherine, in Germany, when they did move to Germany, what were some living conditions you noticed while working on your project? Oh, so, well, when people are, newcomers are applying for or request asylum, they always live in collective accommodation centers, meaning that's a big house with lots of different nations living there. So they, it may be that one family from Syria won't meet anybody from Syria, but would meet only people from Nigeria or whatever. That's very limited space, and they have a small allowance from the state. And our families, the three families we observed, uh, stayed in these collective accommodation centers for more than three years. Mm. The reason being that there is a shortage of apartments 
especially in metropolitan areas, so that they won't find an, a place to go. Oh. Um, so that the living is really quite problematic. And there are, there are sometimes people, who, volunteers who help the children with their homework at the accommodation center, but that's not uh, reliable, actually. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and Becky, what was the living conditions when the refugee families moved to Canada? Yeah, so, so things are um, a bit different in Canada. I think um, refugees, generally speaking, have their own apartments. Um, it is interesting that um, they, they do tend to live in concentrated communities. So um, I think our participants, um, they, they live in the same, <laughs> same apartment building, but, but each family um, had their own um, mm -hmm. apartment. And I, I think um, we actually thought that the conditions were quite good. So it was quite spacious. Everybody had um, his or her own mm. space. So we were actually quite pleased with that. Um, yeah. In something that keeps coming up is uh, learning and L2. I like that term, second language. Uh, Monique, what were some things you noted in your project with how quickly or the speed at which the children would pick up their second language in your project? Well, in some of the re in the research that I have just described in that particular project, we didn't necessarily do anything longitudinal where we could track um, learning development. Mm -hmm. In other um, in other work with focus groups, uh, we found that that, and I think probably um, both Becky and Katrin can speak to this as well. But we found that there's there's really variations, and um, it depends um, a lot on children's pre-migration and post-migration experiences um, and and as as I mentioned already these other factors involved um, so a lot of the teachers we spoke to spoke about um, trauma and how that um, it can manifest itself in various behaviors such as hyperactivity and inattention and these sorts of mm -hmm. things and and that obviously um, hinders as you can imagine one's ability to uh, focus on learning um, in a classroom setting. So I think really it's complex and it depends on, on a variety of factors. I think one of the things that um, they've also said um, is just the resiliency of, of so many children and just with the amazement, the utter amazement they have at how quickly some children can um, pick up the language, especially if they're they're arriving at a young mm. age. Mm. Yeah, we talk about second languages, but these are whole individuals. They have other needs. Um, Becky, what are, some, what are some of the other needs you picked up when you were discussing with the uh, participants of your project? Um, sure, but first of all, I think I I, um, I wanted to address your previous question. So the, uh, the study Catherine and I did um, was situated actually in a broader project. And in that project, we followed uh, refugee children for three years. So we collected uh, three waves of data. So the results were actually quite positive um, in terms of their English um, language and literacy development. We found that um, they improved every oh. year. Not only that, um, they also reduced um, the gap between um, refugee children and just Canadian born children. But on the other hand, we also noticed that uh, their performance, generally speaking, was still low. So the gap was still there. So, um, so they um, they needed uh, they still needed uh, support. Uh, in terms of Arabic development, we found that um, at the same time that they developed their English language and literacy skills, they were able to maintain and improve their um, Arabic proficiency. So. Uh, yeah, so we were quite pleased um, with our findings. I guess um, some of the other things we, we noticed um, included that um, the, the amount of supports they received, I guess, um, at school and at home. Um, they did receive a lot of supports um, at school, but sometimes um, the, the kind of support was not targeted. So it was um, the general support to children who are 
um, second language learners of English or children who are immigrants. But um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the refugees form um, a, a unique population. They, they have their specific needs, so they have more um, needs in, in terms of mental health and well-being. And we're not sure whether that kind of support was provided for refugee children. Mm. Um, if I could continue for a little bit longer. On the other hand, uh, a lot of refugee parents, their English proficiency level was low. They, they depended on their children ah. uh, you know, to, to function in society. So, so it was really hard for them to navigate the school mm. system, especially when children have special needs. So we feel that some kind of support could be provided there to strengthen the, the involvement of parents um, in their children's wow. lives. Wow. Yeah, that, you know, I didn't even think of that yeah. uh, a situation where the parents would be depending on the child for their language needs. Was this something similar in Germany, Catherine? Oh, yes. I mean, I'm, I must say it, it, it's uh, sort of the, the parents actually cannot really support the children in school because they don't know the language and they don't know the culture. So the children are really thrown back on themselves and the help they can get from school is very limited because German schools on the whole, although 40% of the school children are bilingual, still have a monolingual orientation. That is, teachers are not used to teach bilingual children. And the material at school is such that it's fine for monolingual children, but not for bilingual children because of too comp the, the syntax is com too complex, the vocabulary. So the children can't really sit down at home and work on it. Third, there is a problem that because schools in Germany are uh, usually not day, day schools, but they are only for half a day. So the, the children have to do homework in the afternoon. And they don't, since they don't have help from the parents, they really, they have to find somebody else. So volunteers are really uh, very, very extremely important. And we have an, a lot of children who actually go to extensive care at schools, but they still come home because there's too much homework, that they haven't finished homework, that very often they haven't understood what they are supposed to be doing. So children, as well as teachers now, really wish to have a one-to-one -one relationship between child and somebody, a volunteer, mm. to help the children to get through school. Yeah. And that is just dreadful. And uh, you, you know, we've been sort of focusing on the 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 child and the parents, but the family is really a unit. Um, do you notice that, or Monique? Um, I was wondering in your research, did you notice that fragmentation in the unit? And what are things you suggest we could actually start incorporating and treating? the child and the parent as a unit, which a family really is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I echo that completely. I think it's so fundamental, just the idea that, you know, you can't, we can't think about and talk about the development of refugee children without talking about um, the parent, right? Or the parents or the family. Um, <clears throat> so absolutely, I echo that. And, and one of the things that really came out in our research uh, was also just you know, the the power, the powerful role of um, children's perceptions of the support they are getting from adults at mm. home and, and how that was associated with, again, um, those indicators of social and emotional well-being. So the life satisfaction and the, the self-esteem and, and, and optimism, but also the academic skills, so the literacy um, skills. And, and that was, I should point out, regardless without taking into account statistically taking into account their um their parents language competencies in english mm. so even just having that support mm. um i think one of the things that we so often forget and this has come up um time and time again in my interviews is just that children 
have to have to learn how to do school. And it's something that we, um, you know, take for granted growing up in Canada because it's part of what we learn. We learn how to do school from watching TV and, 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 and what our siblings are doing. And this is, we forget that it's such a, um, a social, uh, a socially and culturally constructed idea. And so what I hear so often from teachers is that is something that we need to often teach to children who arrive as refugees because they haven't always had that experience mm. with schools and sometimes their parents haven't either. Mm. And so I think one of the big pieces to for everyone to you know keep in mind is that, yeah, the fundamental piece here is we actually need to create that understanding of what it means to do school in Canada, mm. um, not just... Um, uh, you know, certain concepts, but what does it mean to be in a classroom and, and, and learn things and how do you do that? And how do you do homework and what is homework? Right. So all of these things, um, I think need to be, we need to be very explicit about it, which we, I think, take for granted and forget sometimes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Cause like, if you grew up in that, this is what you grew up in. This is just what you do versus moving from a different country with a different set of cultures and norms and then moving to a new place. And you have to pretty much start learning all these things from zero. Uh, this is such an interesting conversation, but uh, I want to end it with this, though. Uh, I'll start with you, Catherine. Based on your research and this project you've been working on, what are some recommendations you'd love uh, the audience and people listening to take away from this um well just of course we would really like to have um different schools we need day schools we need small classrooms and that's not just for refugee children but for everybody else just as well we need teachers who are informed about their students we found that all the teachers we talked to from our subjects did not know that all of these children had terrible ex experiences on the way from Turkey to Greece. Uh, about three thirds of these children went out of the boat and almost drowned. Um, teachers didn't know that. We would really like to have much, if, they, if these children are in a day school, you can, do so much more with them. You can do dancing, you can do theater with them, you can do a lot of music and all of these things that help children also feel comfortable. I think that's sort of what I think is most important mm. for the children, the refugees in, in Germany. Wow. Thanks, Katrin. And Becky? Yeah, so, so I, I absolutely echo what uh, Katrin said. I think children um, they need more supports and targeted supports and different kinds of supports. So they need support with um, learning uh, English language and literacy. They need support in um, um, mental health and well-being. And parents uh, need support in um, navigating the school system. Um, I also wanted to add that not all refugee children um, are the same, even within the same country. So in, in Canada, uh, we noticed that there are differences between younger and older children. So older children, they, they tend to struggle more. Um, they, they came here later in life, also they have fewer years within the school system. So once they graduate, they are released into society. So and we're not sure if, if there's a system in place to, to provide continued uh, support. Mm -hmm. Uh, but on, on the other hand, I also I also wanted to be positive. Um, so our, our our research shows that um, um, it, the system is working. They are improving. They're improving in both English and Arabic. Uh, they are integrating um, into the Canadian societies. But yeah, so so I think we um, we we need to celebrate um, their achievements and successes, but at the same time, we need to continue to to support them in, in various ways. Mm. Thanks, Becky and Monique. Yeah, I mean, yes, I fundamentally agree with everything that Becky and Catherine have just uh, said in terms of recommendations. Um, and I think I would just sort of uh, this is just building on what they've said, but. Um, one of the things that 
that I would say is, is we also need to really start um, thinking about the supports for refugee children as distinct from the supports for immigrant children, um, because they are s- such fundamentally different groups with different um, experiences. And um, as as Becky said, you know, even within those groups, they're just you know the very unique um, and distinct. Um, groups of children. And so I think, yeah, for me, it's just um, just ensuring that we are able to provide the complexity of um, of supports required for refugee children, because sometimes it's going to be more complex than it would be for um, helping children who arrive as immigrants um, and and their integration integration path. Mm. Wow. What an interesting discussion. Uh, so Becky, Monique and Katrin, thank you so much for sharing and for the amazing work you do for refugee children, both in Germany and here in Canada. Thank you. And also thanks thank for you. coming to the refuge today. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs>